in its subtitle, An Ecological Interpretation of the American Constitution. Um, it's, the good news is, it's done. The bad news is, it's twice as long <laughs> as, it, as it, any publisher will take it. So I'm in the process of, uh, I'm in the process of editing it down and trying to turn it into one single, um, single thread and find a publisher. But it's also got me going back and really looking at the American Constitution. And, and, and I'm using the Constitution, the word Constitution, in two senses. America has two constitutions, really. First, we have that written document that was pet written in Philadelphia in 1787. When you hear the word Constitution, that's, that's usually uh, what people refer to. But we have, there's this other Constitution. It's the Constitution in the broader sense of, well, how's your Constitution? How, you know, how, well, the Constitution in the sense of how a thing is made up. And in that sense, that second unwritten Constitution, Constitution like the British talk about their Constitution, is our values, our culture, our national character. So I'm going to look at, the book is looking at both of those. Today, I want to focus exclusively on that first written Constitution that we're all talking about. Uh, and I want, I want to specifically look at the role of the Supreme Court and use it as an indication of where we are as a nation and maybe where we are as a culture also. Uh, and I want to very briefly deal with some uh, legal issues. I hope no one hears a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, deal with <laughs> Uh, and dealing with dealing with some of those legal issues, and use as an example the Supreme Court's decision in, the, in Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission, which everyone is a little bit familiar with that. Okay, and um, hopefully that'll set up some bigger issues, like the role of money in American politics. And next month I want to talk about the whole issue of rights and liberties. And I'll use that to move into the last three lectures to return to this very big notion of the of the environment, the economy, okay, and uh, where we might be headed. I apologize. Let me let me just quickly deal with a couple of structural issues about the, the American judicial system. And I apologize if this is overly simplistic. The American judicial system has been referred to as a dual hierarchy. Okay. It's dual. It's dual because we have two legal systems in this country. We have a federal system that deals obviously with federal laws, and we have a state judicial system that deals with state laws. And the state judicial system is very important because it's the states that have the police power, which means most criminal law starts here. Okay? It's hierarchical. It's hierarchical. Because you have lower courts in the Federalist, we have 88 district courts. We are in the Western District of the North Carolina, all right, so which is Charlotte, Asheville, Statesman. Then you have appellate courts. We are in the Fourth Circuit Court, which is Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, North and South Carolina. And then, of course, you have the U.S. Supreme Court. Over here, you have all sorts of state courts of limited jurisdiction, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Uh, one of the big things, the reason this is important is where cases take place depends upon where cases start and how they work their way through the system depends upon which courts have jurisdiction, okay? Jurisdiction is the authority of a court to render a binding decision in a case. So if there's a federal issue, it'll start off in the federal courts. If there's a state issue, it'll start off in the state courts. If it's a combined state and federal issue, it might work its way up through the states and then over to the U.S. Supreme Court. But jurisdiction is one key concept. The other key concept has to do with who is entitled or who is permitted to be in court and have their case heard, okay? This is referred to as standing. 
<coughs> who has standing to be in court? In order to have standing, you have to have several things. First, you must have an injury. Right? Courts in this country, it's an adversarial system. They do not give advisory opinions. If, if the, the state of Delaware, for instance, for over 200 years had a law on the books making it illegal, it was a blasphemy law, making it illegal to say anything against Jesus Christ or the God, and the penalty was to have the letter B branded into your forehead. Okay? Yeah. Last one. Does that law violate the Constitution? <laughs> uh, maybe. Well, why does it, why was it on the why was it on the books for two hundred years? Could I go to court and say, look, I want you to declare this law unconstitutional? And the answer is no, I can't. Why not? Because I don't have standing. Because the judges would say, are you being hurt by this? Is anybody being hurt by this? Has anybody ever been arrested by under this law? See this? Without injury, you just can't ask the court for advice. Do you think this law is constitutional? There must be injury, okay? And there, here's the toughest one. Who can be injured? You must have this thing. You must... And here's where it's getting tough. You must have this thing called personhood. You must be something. Notice I'm not saying somebody. You must have something that is capable of being hurt, capable of being injured, and the courts have got to be able to redress that injury. Just because, just because the courts have jurisdiction and you have standing. That doesn't mean they're gonna. That doesn't mean you know they're gonna hear it. Everybody got that? Because this is gonna be this is gonna be important. What is a corporation? Do corporations have personhood? Now this is difficult because the word personhood, I think we'll all agree, is somewhat awkward. And so what's happened in America? What's happened in America is is. We've developed this almost equally difficult thing. Our corporation is people. Okay. Our corp can corporations not what what you have to do is you have to educate the American people that what they're really asking is do corporations have standing in court? Okay. And the answer to that is yes. Okay. Um as far back as 1815, get ready to come off a series of Supreme Court decisions. In the case of Tarrant versus Taylor, the Supreme Court made an interesting distinction. They talked about public corporations. That is cities, counties, towns are public corporations. The city of Asheville is a public corporation, but as a public corporation, that means that the state legislature can do whatever it wants with it. It can abolish the city of Asheville tomorrow. It can require Asheville to, to get their permission to annex and all that stuff. And then what the courts did in Tarrant versus Taylor is they came up with this strange notion of a private corporation. I say strange because logically, private and corporation is a contradiction. <laughs> If, it's, if you're incorporated, that was a public act that did it, but they said, no, uh, what's a private corporation? A private corporation is every, anything that's not a public corporation, okay? So General Electric is a private corporation. As in 1815, we established in this country the notion of a private corporation, okay? In 1819, in the Dartmouth College case, what I'm going to try to get you to see this step-by-step -step process. In the Dartmouth College case, they said private corporations have protections under the contract clause of the Constitution. So in other words, Yes, there is this thing called a private corporation, and yes, 
They are con they have certain things. For instance, the state legislature cannot impair contracts of private corporations. They're not quite at the point where they're saying corporations have rights, all right? But they're moving. They're moving to the in the degree to to say the corporations have something of personhood to them. Got it? Then in 1844, the Supreme Court ruled in the Louisville, Cincinnati, and Charlotte, Louisville, Cincinnati, and Charlotte Railroad versus somebody uh, less than Private corporations are citizens of the state in which they're incorporated. See it? So now corporations are citizens. And then the big bomb came in 1886 with the Santa Clara Railroad. Uh, oh, excuse me, Santa Clara County. Versus Southern Pacific Railroad. <clears throat> Where the court ruled the corporations are constitutionally protected persons. Okay. Between 1844 and 1886, what happened? You had the Civil War, <coughs> and you had the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments being passed. And the 14th Amendment says, nor shall any person be declared, be denied life, liberty, or property without due process of the law. Okay. That's the 14th Amendment. What the court ruled of the Santa Clara County was the corporations are persons under the 14th Amendment. Is this happening in any other countries? <coughs> are we standing alone with this kind of thing? I, I, I think that, it, it, you know, the, the real answer is I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I cannot conceive of how you could have, and I mean, believe I spent a lot of time trying to think of, what would I change? Would I repeal any of these decisions? Revoke it? I mean, where, what I'm going to talk to in a little bit is the difference between logic okay, and consequences. Logically, this seems a little bit strange. But as far as the consequences, why did the Supreme Court do this? The Supreme Court did this because, probably because, I cannot conceive of even a rudimentary capitalist society, you know, without some form, without some form, can you conceive of, of a society where corporations, where you don't have corporations? And if you're going to have corporations, then the, then the question becomes, well, I mean, uh, th then the, what protections does the act of incorporation give you? And then, and then I think this is the big one. Once you give corporations standing, right, um, then, you've, then you've said to some extent they're people. One of the things, one of the things that really busted this open for me was, was remember after the Citizens United case, President Obama gave a State of the Union address, and he talked about we have to do something to reverse the, the Supreme Court decision in, in Citizens United, and and the camera focused down there, and Justice Samuel Alito, who was in the majority of that case, was just shaking his head no, and he made a comment that was he made a comment that I was it was interesting. It was like. He said, quote, the Citizens United case was a very easy case to decide. He said, it didn't take a lot of thought. 
And, and when you go back, yeah, I can see this. You're talking about 200 years of precedent here. And the problem is, each of these is linked. You know, maybe, let's repeal Santa Clara County. But how can you repeal Santa Clara County without repealing Louisville, Cincinnati, right? If they're citizens, then they're people. And how can you do that without saying that they don't have contracts? And that's the tough, that's, I, I, I don't, the answer is I don't know the answer to yours, but I just can't imagine how corporations don't have, don't have standing in um, Britain or any other democracy. I, and not only that, would I change it if I could? I want to be able to sue BP. Not because not only can corporations, what this all means is not only can corporations be injured, corporations can also injure. Right? So if British Petroleum Due to negligence, if British Petroleum dumps, you know, millions of gallons of, of oil into the Gulf of Mexico, I want to be able to sue them. And I don't, want, I don't mean suing the, the, the chairman of the board. I'll go after him, too. But I want to sue that corporation. I want to bring that corporation into court. Now, if you say, okay, but you can't say, you know, I get to sue the corporation and it can't hire a lawyer. <laughs> you couldn't say that. So if they have standing, they have the right to be sued and they have the right to sue. And if they have those rights, then they have the right to hire lawyers. Then they have the right to call witnesses. They have all sorts of procedural rights of due process. Um, the question is, do they also have substantive rights? I mean, they have rights in court. Do they also have substantive rights? Do they have the right to freedom of speech? See this? Do they have the right... Here's the one that the one that's terrifying me. Do they have the right to privacy? Can a corp this is what's coming down the road, by the way. A corporation, I can see an agricultural corporation saying, disclosing where these tomatoes were grown violates our corporate right to privacy. Mm -hmm. Telling you what's in this cereal <laughs> yeah. is a violation of our privacy. Now, they're already protected. They do not have to disclose any copyrighted information. That, that's, that's already given. How does, the court, how does the Supreme Court decide these cases? What, what theories of jurisprudence do they use? This, this, will, this will move us a step forward. There, is, there has been, for a long time, the dominant view is what's called declarative jurisprudence. Follow me here, because it's going to end up someplace important. This is, this is the legal theory that underpins the American Constitution. Here it's different because under here, it is clear that under the American system you have separation of powers, which means you have an independent judiciary, okay? Which means that the judiciary is not supposed to make policy, okay? Making public policy is the function of the legislative branch is the function of the elected branch. Justice, Justice Scalia would be quite quick to point out nobody elected him. Okay? He cannot make policy. Well, then what is his job? His job, his job follows this. This is what Justice Scalia would say. He would say that there is a higher law tradition in America. 
America belie Americans believe that there can be such a thing as unjust laws. I never met an American. I, I told last last time I said I quoted John Hobbes or Thomas Hobbes. There can be no such thing as an unjust law. I've never met an American that believes that. <laughs> All right. Why not? Because Americans believe that there is some higher standard, higher than the positive law the legislatures make. All right. And 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 laws, positive laws that violate that higher tradition should be declared aren't, aren't laws at all. And then secondly then, the, con our, the Constitution is our embodiment of that law. Americans, Americans are, are Americans are raised since they're, as Abraham Lincoln would say, prattling on their mother's laps to worship the Constitution. It is our national religion. Okay. The, const the Constitution, therefore, step three, the Constitution is fixed. It's permanent. It can be amended, very difficult. But the principles emb embodied in the Constitution do not change over time. If you want to get Ron Paul, if you want to set Ron Paul off in a fit, Tell, talk to him about an evolving constitution. <laughs> you know, higher law does not evolve. Okay? Therefore, the constitution. So, if it's fixed, for the principles contained in it are applicable everywhere. The constitution has all has the answer to all questions. The function of a judge, therefore, is not to make policy. The function of a judge is a case is brought before him or her. They look at that case. They look at the law involved in that case. And they ask the question, is that law con logically consistent with the Constitution? Okay? If it is, leave it alone. It's not the judge's job to say if it's a good law or a bad law. Okay? If, if, if it's a wise law or, not, or a stupid law. Their, all, their only question is, does the law that, that Congress passed, is it logically contradicts the Constitution? The declarative theory believes in logic. Okay? It believes in judicial restraint. Judges should not make policy. Okay? <clears throat> but, may I interrupt you? Sure, please judges do. Then? Over time, with ongoing decisions, that does influence policy, right? Isn't policy influenced? Who are you asking this question of? You. Just let me, let me, my opinions don't matter. Let me tell you how Justice Scalia would answer, respond. Justice Scalia would say, yes, of course, the policies evolve, but the principles behind them do not. Okay? The principles of, okay. the principles of separation of powers. Does, does not change over time. And when you're asking, and when you ask me, Justice Scalia, to make policy, you're asking me to take on a legislative function. You're asking me to violate the Constitution, and I just want to know who will abide by it. I think, I think, let me say, now, back as Frank Kalinowski. <laughs> I don't think you can understand these issues unless you can understand both sides of them. Okay? Antonin Scalia is not a fool. He may be probably the most educated, intelligent person on that court. And I think, if, and I think to understand how he gets to the decisions he reaches, you have to get inside of his mind. And, and, and he would respond to your he would respond to your question like that. Yes, the policies evolve. Yes, the policies change, but the principles do not. Okay, this principle. These principles are 
embedded in, embedded in stare decisis, the rule of precedent. And these presidents all go back. And, and he would say, I know he would, that the thing about this line of precedent, as the lawyers would say, is each is logically consistent with the one before it. And I confess, you know, whether object, being objective or bars, I look back at those and say, Let Scalia answer this question. Why, why is the Constitution so holy? I mean, is, is there a divine intervention or something? We always look at Congress now is flawed. You know, people, politicians now are flawed. Why are, why are our, the constitutional uh, offices so unflawed? Why are they, why are they so perfect? No, and, 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 and that's an excellent question. And the answer is, the answer is, legal lawyers are trained. Harvard lawyers are very well trained to this principle number two here. There is nothing above the con. You don't. You know, when you, when a law comes before when a law comes before the Supreme, when, <coughs> Supreme Court, right? It is the function of the Supreme Court to interpret that law vis-a-vis -vis the Constitution. It is not their function to interpret the Constitution. Okay. I mean, it, it is not the purpose to say does the Constitution abide by the higher law. Let me tell you a story. Back during the first Punic War when I was graduating from college, uh, a buddy of mine, Griffiths, he graduated and I graduated. He went to law school, I went to graduate school. He went to Santa Clara, he went to Santa Clara Law School, I went to uh, Claremont Graduate School. And, and so we kind of followed our careers and we talked, we get on the phone. And go back and forth. And when I finished, when I finished my uh, coursework, I had to take my comprehensive exams for my PhD. And I'll never forget my first question on my first comprehensive exam was, "What is justice?" You have eight hours to respond. And you know, fourteen blue books later, <laughs> I came walking out. I could, and I couldn't wait to get to a telephone uh, after having a cold beverage. <laughs> and I called Griff. I said, Griff, I said, I got to, I've been thinking about you all afternoon. I said, the first question on my qualifying exams was, what is justice? And I'll never forget his answer. He says, Jesus, he says, that's a question we never get asked in law school. <laughs> we do not talk it. We know it just that's justice. <clears throat> I mean, uh, that's why Chapter two of my book. When you have people that challenge, which challenge the Constitution, is the Constitution democratic? Is the Constitution does the Constitution provide economic justice? The question I want to ask, the question my book asks, is: Is the Constitution of the United States ecologically sustainable? You can answer that any way. I don't think you can say it's unimportant. <laughs> okay. But people that have challenged the justice of the, the you know, Charles Beard <clears throat> and, and the progressives that challenged the constitutionality, I mean, the, the, the Constitution was a just document, uh, they are seen as being un American, fair. I mean, look, have you been to Washington? This is a Look at the statue. The visual image that we construct to portray our Constitution, our Supreme Court, the statue in front of the, of the Supreme Court building is a statue of justice. First of all, it's a woman, <laughs> which I find interesting. Second, and appropriate. Anyway. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Secondly, she's blindfolded. She's blindfolded. She doesn't care what race you are. She doesn't care. The, she doesn't care about the consequences. Okay. And in one hand, she's holding a scale. You put the law in one balance. You put the Constitution in the other balance. And you just stand there and hold them out. Do they balance each other? Fine. What she got in her other hand? A sword. Okay. If the law balances with the Constitution, 
you keep the sword in its sheath. If the law does not balance with the Constitution, you chop it off. You declare it null and void. That, that statue is the clearest visual image of, of the declarative theory of justice, I can, jurisprudence I can think of. It leads, this leads to, of course, this is the theory behind American conservatism. Okay? Well, things change. Let me get my dates right here. Come on, where are you? It's 1908. It's the height of the progressive era. Progressives are coming into power in Congress and in the states. And you have a Supreme Court that is very, very conservative. But one progressive has managed to sneak onto the Supreme Court. His name is Oliver Wendell Holmes. And he is, he is the absolute picture of Boston rich Brahmin elite, long handlebar mustache, uh, lieutenant in the Civil War, wounded at Antietam, you know, Harvard educated. And now he's sitting on the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court has to hear the case of Mueller versus Oregon. The state of Oregon, then and now, is controlled by progressives. They've passed a law saying that women who work in dangerous industries, laundry, things with chemicals and things like this, cannot cannot be required to work more than 10 hours a day. This was, this was what progressive politics looked like in 1908, all right? Um, it was an attempt to regulate working conditions. Mueller, who owned a laundry, challenged the legality of the Oregon law, claiming it violated his contract with his employees. Got it? Now, the Supreme Court had to hear the case of Mueller versus Oregon. Anybody around would have told you that the Supreme Court is going to strike down that Oregon law. You just, if you use this, if you use this theory here, if you use this logic, then you have to say the Oregon, the Oregon regulation of labor conditions and, wor and working hours violates the contract between the employer and employee, boom. And they had done that. I mean, they, had, they were doing it constantly, okay? Oh, if there was a moment in history I could go back to. <laughs> oh, God, I would have loved to have been there in that Supreme Court building when the lawyer for Oregon walked into the court. The state of Oregon had hired this little skinny, short little guy. I can picture him right now, you know, poorly dressed. He was Jewish and looked it. He wore little wire ribbon glasses. And he walked into the court. His name was Louis Brandeis. And Louis Brandeis came into the court to defend Oregon's right to, to regulate businesses. Say it. And he laid down what later became known as sociological jurisprudence. Sometimes called legal realism. Okay. And he argued to he argued before the justices and you could I can you, I wanted to see the expression on Oliver Wendell Holmes' face. Okay. When Brand and I said, look, this Constitution, you people are not just simply logical machines. The Constitution of the United States is an evolving document. It changes 
as policies and times change. Um, the truth behind the Constitution change over time. There exists not only a higher law, he says, there exists a common good. And you justices are as committed to that common good as you are to this higher, higher uh, principles. And therefore, the court must consider the impact of its decisions. It's not just logic, it's consequences. And whereas for all these years, lawyers had been walking into the Supreme Court with case after case after case, that they used to prop up their decisions. Brandeis walked into court with health records, with sociological impact statements. What is the impact on young girls that are working 10 hours a day, 10, six days a week? What is the impact on their health of, of, the, law, of the lies and the chemicals? He did not use logic, he used evidence. See it? This, um... He ended up on the Supreme Court himself, didn't he? Uh, can you imagine? Can you imagine that, I mean, the impact of, the impact uh, that he had on Oliver Wendell Holmes, you don't have to imagine it, I'll tell you what it was. A few years later, there became an opening on the Supreme Court. Now, one of the things the Supreme Court justices never do is to campaign for candidates. Oliver Wendell Holmes went to Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States, and said, I think it's time that we have a Jew on the Supreme Court. And may I recommend this young lawyer, Louis Brandeis, and Wilson appointed Louis Brandeis to the Supreme Court. And if you want some, and for the next geez, 20 or 30 years, these people, these people were always in the majority. I mean, the court kept coming down with conservative decisions after conservative decisions after conservative decisions. But the Holmes Brandeis dissents, the Holmes Brandeis pounding of this legal realism, face reality. But why did he have to use the the Jewish? Oh, I I think it was I think it was than progressive. Yeah, I I think it I think it was a case for they were arguing for diversity. Okay. Okay. They was arguing for diversity. It's ironic. I checked before I came in here. Still are. Do you know that there's not a single Protestant on the Supreme Court? Five Catholics and three Jews. Yeah. <laughs> and six and three. Yeah. Can you see the differences in the line? And this, this has become. You, if you can understand the difference between, well, let me finish off this story. Brandeis and Holmes were the minority. Um, Oregon, by the way, did win the case. Brandeis was a minority for years, but something happened in American law. Law professors started taking this up, started teaching this <coughs> Yale. Okay? Carl Llewellyn, Roscoe Pound. Uh, a whole series of, this is how change comes, I guess, a whole series of law professors started, I mean, they kept teaching this, but they kept teaching this also. 
one of my one of my finest moments, Jessica Culpepper. If anybody ever finds Jessica, we'll tell her I said. Jessica Culpepper was one of my students at Warren Wilson. <laughs> She got accepted to Harvard Law School, which uh, she also got accepted at Georgetown. Harvard teaches pretty much this. Georgetown has a program where you learn, it, it's called like Plan B or something like this. You learn the form, you learn the rudiments of formal legal education, but you also take courses in justice. You also take courses in sociology and things like this. And she called up, she called up, admission uh, into this special Georgetown program is pretty exclusive. She called up Georgetown, she says, I've been accepted, can I get into this special program? And they said, well, it usually takes us a couple of months to decide and we haven't made our decision yet. And she said, well, I've been accepted at Harvard Law, and they need to know an answer. How about if I call you back in two hours and you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> she, called, she called Georgetown back. Uh, I don't know if it was two hours, but briefly back. And they said, you're into the program. And the only student I have ever had to turn down an acceptance at Harvard Law School, <laughs> she, she called Harvard and said, thanks, but I'm going to Georgetown. The last I heard, Jessica had just been, bothered, had just been admitted to practice law before the United States Supreme Court. These are my buttons busting. <laughs> <laughs> I just got taught in the law schools. She says, by the 1930s, now, now, these students of legal realism were starting to practice law. They were starting to get into judgeships. So that now, when the 1950s came along, okay, people like Earl Warren, Brennan, Blackman, Frankfurter, who had been raised, I mean, how did they, how did they get to this judicial activism, this liberal, they've been trained in it. And it all goes back to Mueller versus Ark. Okay. But don't give up on these folks. So from then until now, I think what you can see is I mean, the differences between the conservatives and the liberals on the, on the court today the conservatives, it's not one of intelligence, certainly, the conservatives strictly adhere, Scalia, Alito, Roberts, okay, they strictly adhere to, or I don't know, strictly, they go by this, okay? The liberals, on, they want to know what's the logic, okay? What if I were a admitted to Harvard, but I suddenly found that I had strong leanings toward this realism. After X years at Harvard, am I just automatically No, I mean, no, this? Lawrence tried. He's tried it a lot, Harvard. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are professors, sorry. There are professors at Harvard that teach this. But Harvard, edu Harvard legal education, I don't think I'm slandering anybody to say it's a very conservative education. I mean, you will, you will be able to recite every case? Good Lord, you're going to be an expert at it. And you will know, understand logic. Okay? And for these people, when, and you'll know how to respond to these people. These people. When these people say, yes, but what's going to be the consequences of this decision? What's going to be the impact of this decision? Roberts, Alito, Kennedy? Celia, they're going to say, that's not our job. I, don't you believe in separation of powers? Making policy, this is making, you're asking, this is making policy. Now, to which Bader Ginsburg, Sotomayor, Kagan, Breyer, they're going to answer, of course it's making policy, and you're naive to think we don't. Relevant to Citizens United. 
Oh, immediately relevant. I mean, this is why, this is why, can you see it? I mean, this is why Alito, why did Alito make this statement? It was an easy decision to make. Because logically, it is. I, I, I apologize, I should have, and I will log on and look at some of the defense, dissents in, in, in Citizens United. What is, what are, you, you can guess, what's the dissent going to be? I don't even know what it is. Oh, well, okay, we'll get through it. Right? No, <laughs> I, I apologize. Yeah. The dissent's going to be this. The, consequ of money. the consequences of this decision, they won't, spell, they, won't, they won't spell it out. They won't spell it out this bluntly, but it's probably the end of any form of democracy in this country. That's a pretty significant consequence. <laughs> Consequences be damned. <laughs> Consequences, that's not, that's not our job. Okay? This is the price we pay for separation of powers. Now, to answer your previous question, I mean, you know, in other countries, they don't, they don't pretend that there's separation of powers. There's no separation of powers in British politics. They don't have a written constitution. And they don't have a written constitution. Maybe two advantages. They <laughs> okay? Logic, consequences. See it? Okay. Let's turn then. Oops. Let's turn then to Citizens United. If anybody invents a Wayback Machine, I want to see Brandeis and Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. This was decided in 2010. Okay? That means <coughs> let's bring everybody up to date on it. Okay? In 2002, Congress passed what was called the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, the BCRA, okay? otherwise known more commonly as the McCain Feingold. Now, the BCRA was a further step from the 1971 and 1974 Federal Election Campaign Act. This, this, is, this is campaign financing. This is a brief history of campaign financing in America. Okay, 1971 and 74. Okay, uh, 2001 was it two? Um, McCain final. Okay. What this campaign finance laws did was they set limits on how much you could contribute to political parties. Okay? They provided for public financing of presidential elections. They, had, they said that spending must, you must declare uh, the sources of your funds. Okay? You must have public disclosure. And the Cain Feingold limited how much you could spend 30 and 60 days prior to an election. Got it? Now, they also, and this is 71 and 74, 71 and 74 made a very important distinction. They had, they distinguished between campaign spending which they define as spending designed to get someone elected office, to office, all right? Vote for Karen, she's a terrific candidate. I am advocating her election, got it? Since the Congress can control campaigns, Congress can control spending on campaigns. Follow that? But they made another distinction between what's called issue ads. An issue ad does not advocate the election of anyone. Okay? It is simply a statement of opinion, argument. Right? So I can put out an ad. If I put out an ad that says, elect Karen Nolan to the 
U.S. House. That's campaign submitting. If I put out an ad that's saying, well, it's true that Karen was never indicted for fraudulent misappropriation of funds. <laughs> <laughs> that statement is true. All right? I'm not advocating the election of anyone. And it's an issue bad. See this? Where we say overturned uh, Obamacare or something like that. That's an issue, man. Notice this. Notice this. Clear cutting. <laughs> positive, positive messages tend to be considered campaign spending. Issue ads, you're always, you're always legally covered if you go negative. Okay? So in effect, in effect, one of the one of the consequences of, of FICA and McCain find what I think was to greatly increase the amount of negative the amount of negative message. Um, add to that the fact that public opinion polls show two things. One, Americans hate negative campaigning advertising, and two, Americans usually vote according to uh, negative campaigning is tremendously effective. Back in 71, 74, they didn't have to have that disclaimer on the bottom one, right? Because no. now they do. I, yeah, no, I think, I think, I think the dis, it's not a disclaimer. Well, it's a disclosure. It's a dis, it, exactly. Yeah, I think the disclosure came out, I, you'd have to force me to go through yeah, my minutes, I but I think the disclosure came in 74, I believe. I don't remember. Yeah. What they have today. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I paid for this and all this. Yeah, which probably is. <laughs> Well, I'm jumping ahead, but I can't imagine how that can stand. I mean, that that's going to be the next thing overturned, especially if you get, you know if corporations have privacy. You know, it's not your business who I who I can. All right, in 2008, you got this. That's the legal background. In 2008, um, Citizens United released a document called. I think we just called Hillary. Okay? It was, in fact, a smear on Hillary Clinton. Okay? It was, in fact, um, an attempt, oh, again, it, the, you know, it was, it was an attempt to argue that Hillary Clinton should not be elected president, should not get the nomination to be elected president. Citizens United wanted to run that up to, right up to the election. In, in various primaries, in, in various primary states, the, they went to court to get an injunction against the Federal Election Commission, following this, to allow you know blocking the blocking the FEC from blocking them from running their from running their um, from running their campaign. Their argument was once again fairly simple. This. This documentary is freedom of speech. Okay. As a private corporation, as a private group, we have certain rights. See this? That among those rights are freedom of speech. Now, in 1976, these cases have to do with standing. Okay? These cases have to do with money. Okay? In 1976, in a case called Buckley versus Vallejo, United States Senator Jim Buckley took the Federal Election Commission which is the organization in charge of enforcing the Federal Election Campaign Act, okay, took them to court and challenged certain aspects of the 74 Federal Election Campaign Act. Okay? What the court ruled in Buckley versus Vallejo is spending money is speech. Okay? You can, you can the, con the government, Congress, can limit how much you contribute to political parties, so-called soft money. And they can limit how much an individual candidate can respond. But independent groups, which became known as political action committees, 
independent, independent political action committees can raise as much money as they can. There can be no limits on how much money you raise, okay? And there can be no restrictions on how much money you spend. So what the Supreme Court did, what five justices in the Supreme Court did in the Citizens United case, is simply to take Santa Clara County and combine it with Buckley versus Vallejo. This is, best, this is a good explanation of this as I can get. Do you see it? Corporations are people. They have personhood. They are persons. They have rights. That among those rights is speech. Guaranteed by the First Amendment to the Constitution. And spending money is speech. Therefore, any law passed by Congress that limits how much money corporations or public or public uh, action committees, political action committees, or 527, um, another form of groups, no matter how much they, they can raise as much as they can get, and they can spend it as long as they're spending it on issue ads, they can spend it as much as they want. So now, yes, so now, what is it? Two and a half years before the presidential elections, right? The Obamacare ads are coming out. Okay. And the Democrat, well, I, I don't, well, I guess it's the Democratic Party that, that's funding the Hagan thing. But you're getting, you're getting an allies. Now, Interestingly enough, Citizens United kept in place the public disclosure elements. But anybody that's looked at this is going to tell you that that's the next thing to go. Because if they have freedom, because if corporations have freedom of speech, if corporations have not only standing, right, but rights under the Constitution, what constitutional rights do they have? Clearly they have procedural rights. Now we know they have freedom of speech. Well, the take disclosure part wasn't raised in that uh, uh, in Citizens United, was it? It wasn't argued before the court. I don't. I, I can't answer your question. I, do you know? No. No, I don't. Know, I don't know if it was argued or just left standing. Okay. But see, me, if you compare, if you combine Santa Clara County with Buckley versus Vallejo with Griswold versus Connecticut, which says that the Constitution of the United States provides a right to privacy. Why not uh, unlimited spending on campaign? Uh, campaign? Oh, uh, well, not, yeah. That, that hasn't happened yet, but that wasn't part of the decision, but that, that could happen too. The Citizens United was only, uh, only dealt with issue ads? I think so. Mm -hmm. I think so. All right. But there still are there still are limits on campaign spending. Well, there's limits on campaign contribution. Here's there's limits to campaign. No, no, I do know the answer to that. There are limits. There are no limits on on contributions or spending to PACs. Okay. There are limits to spend to to contributions and spend or contributions not to spending to political campaigns okay so what's happening now what's happening is you have Clinton for president as a political campaign then you have the Hillary Clinton political action committee okay these people can raise and spend as much as they want these people cannot, as long as these people are distinct from those people, both sides are obeying the law. Now, what's the truth? The truth is that these, that, that, that these you know, do you think there's any connection between the Hillary Clinton Political Action Committee and Hillary Clinton's campaign? <laughs> Let me think. So all they had to do was declare themselves a corporation. <clears throat> Not a corporation. Oh, well, yeah, well, they had to incorporate okay. as a political action committee. 
Okay? That's a nonprofit. I mean, there's all sorts of, you know, nonprofits are corporations, right? Yeah. Yeah. What bugs me, and has bugged me for three years now, is it makes so goddamn much sense. <laughs> You know it's going to destroy democracy, like you said. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, logic and consequences. The logic of it, I don't know if I'd call it impeccable, but it's good. But the consequences, you know, I mean, the money, there's no doubt, there's no doubt that we're, we're going to, we're going to have, 2016 is going to be a presidential election where each side is going to spend a billion dollars. See. Well, we all want to see the consequences of it in North Carolina. Oh, in North mm -hmm. Carolina. You know, our Pope bought, our part bought the governorship. And the legislature. Yeah, yeah. You didn't want to go pay a part. <laughs> uh, so the media is who benefits. Pardon? The media. They're the only kind of benefits. Oh, tremendously benefit. They tremendously benefit. They can't raise the prices of their ads high enough to dissuade these people from purchasing time. Right? Tremendous benefit. What sustains them for four years? When you look at newspapers and you look at TV radio. Yeah, yeah, and it's start. I mean, one of the things, no, I'm talking about foreign countries. One of the, I mean, one of the amazing things about elections in America that, that completely befuddles foreigners, Europeans, is the length of our elections. I mean, and in now it is, now it is certain. I mean, you know, they say, they say that, you know, the, 2016 presidential elections don't start until after the 2014 congressional elections, but they've started. They've started. They're raising money. Isn't it true in foreign countries it's a shorter time frame and they're limited to what they can spend? That I don't know. Yeah, I've heard. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's changed. What yeah, yeah, I don't know. But they only um, can spend so much for so much time. Yeah, but what do they do about issue ads? What stops them? I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, there, I mean, I, the British and French and Germans have as much free speech as we do, right? Doesn't get the. They have commercial television. Okay. It doesn't get the press that we do. Yeah. Well, you asked me if I was going to be. That's about as objective as I can get. <laughs> uh, let's get a little biased. <laughs> 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 let's suppose just for yucks and grins, that we want to try to save the American political system. <laughs> yeah, yeah besides, besides that. Granted, it's an uphill battle. What would you do? Well, we've got a campaign going on right now to change the, to have a, uh, an amendment to the Constitution to overturn. But what, would you over, yeah, but what would you overturn? I mean, what would you change about this? Well, I'd change a lot of things. If I, I put them in, in the Constitution itself that, that, specific limits. But how? But, but what do you do? How does that affect free speech? It means everybody can spend up to whatever I put in the Constitution. And that's and a, they're all. And free, that's all the free speech and all you free, get. And they're all free to turn. I don't know if I like telling you, tell me, you can talk, but only for this much. <laughs> you know, you can, you can, you can publish, you can publish, somebody told me you can publish books, you can write your, you can publish your book, but you can't print more than 5,000 copies. Okay, so for every dollar you spend on political ads, you have to give to a charity. 
<laughs> oh, like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or if you have to get to the poor, you have to find a way to to make the life of some people. But doesn't that set a problem? Better. Like, if I don't like the charity, you well, want me to donate charity, to? Well, maybe not a charity, but maybe just make. I mean, put it. Dominate our conservative. We don't move to the center. We become, in fact, even more conservative, and we use issue ads to smear the Democrats as a bunch of neo-socialists. See it? In fact, what we do is we polarize the system even more. Okay? And these people start staying home, start staying home, start staying home. If we had strong political parties, I'm not saying this is heaven on earth. I, you know, I know about Tammany Hall. But, these, but the Democrat, if we had the political parties nominating, I would trust the self-interest of the political parties to say, we've got to nominate somebody that can appeal to the middle. Of all people, Karl Rove now understands that. Karl Rove is the one that's coming out, more than anyone else, Karl Rove is the one that's coming out saying the Tea Party is killing the Republicans. And of course... <laughs> He's not saying that because he's a secret agent for the Democratic Party. <laughs> All right? He's saying that he's saying that because he wants to win elections. I'm willing to trust the self-interest of the political party machine. Then if you want to get involved, then you get involved in parties. You get involved, you work your way up through the system. Yeah, that's the British system. Uh, and we have, and then people get to choose. I mean, first you got to get Americans away from this notion of, oh, I don't vote for the party, so I just vote for the person. Well, when you do that, guess what? The person that you elect isn't going to call you. They're going to call the political action committee. And furthermore, they're, I mean, things are really desperate when I start to feel sympathy for John Boehner. <laughs> All right? But he can't control his own party. What's he going to say? What, what's he going to say? I mean, you've got 35, 40, you've got 35, 40 Tea Party Republicans there that won't go along with you. What's he going to say? Go along with me or I'll cut off your campaign financing? They're going to look and say, I never got any campaign financing from you. They're going to say, <clears throat> they're going to say, well, go along with me or else you won't get to run as a Republican. He's, they're going to say, I don't, pay, I don't need you to determine who I, who I run for. And what are they going to say? What are they going to say? Vote, vote for me or we'll run, a, we'll run a moderate against you in the campaign? They're going to say, I'm not worried about moderate opposition. I'm worried about opposition from someone that's even further right wing than I am. So you're, you're saying that if, if we made these changes, we wouldn't even have to worry about whether money is free speech or whether corporations exactly. are persons. That, exactly. And, and it would be okay to, to uh, contribute as much as you wanted to to political parties. Uh, we wouldn't limit that. But with the Supreme Court we've got now, any law that tried to do what you're suggesting would be called unconstitutional. Well, I don't see anything unconstitutional about strengthening political parties. Political parties aren't even mentioned in the Constitution. I know, but the things you have to do in order to strengthen them. Yeah, we'd have be. to. Yeah, we'd have to repeal. You we'd have it. to repeal FICA, McCain, Feingold, okay. and substitute in. And then we'd have to do some. And, when, and the substitution is going to be declared unconstitutional I because it's going to be working against the same principles that. No, 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 I, no, I think I understand. No, none of this has to do with whether or not corporations are people. Corporations can still be people. Corporations can still have rights. Corporations can still have speech. We don't have to. What's nice about this is none of it requires a constitutional amendment. And, and like I said, you, they could, you could give as much as you want. No, no problem with... Uh, and you could require, I mean... In Great Britain, in Great Britain, every union member is is taxed by the Labour Party, 
And then that money goes directly, I mean, you can opt out now, but that money goes directly out from your wages and it goes directly into the, into the labor part. In Germany, they make, in Germany, they make no bit out of it. The CDC, the Christian Democrats, they are, they represent the big corporate interest in Germany. Corporations in Germany, they don't give their money to issue ads. Where do they give their money to? They give their money to the CDC. To you, excuse me. Okay? Labor unions in Germany give their money to the free Democrats. Here's, a, here's two other suggestions. None of this, all this, however, requires that we also turn the, con turn the Congress and this, turn the government of the United States into at least something that vaguely approaches a, a democracy. In the Senate, we need, desperately need, to eliminate the institution of the senatorial hold. Okay? This is very new. This is only like 15 years old. Now, I don't think you're going to eliminate the filibuster. You, you know what that is, talking to Bill to death, all right? But damn it, if you want to filibuster a bill, get up and do it. In the past few years, 10, 15, they've had this notion of a senatorial hold where a senator doesn't even have to filibuster. All he or she has to do is write a letter to the majority leader saying, I want to put a hold on this piece of legislation. And it cannot come up to a vote unless you get enough votes, 60, to pass cloture. That means that, means that in fact, 40 senators, and, and, and that 40 senators representing 20 states, which probably represents maybe 25% of the American population, can in fact block anything that goes through the Senate. I, 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 you know, I, I like the filibuster. I think if you're really passionate about a, an issue, a minority ought to have a right to, um, to talk it to them, or at least postpone it. But let's reserve that filibuster for very special occasions. Eliminate, eliminate the Senate. And then in the House, the real problem is in the House of Representatives, I mean, we have virtually no democracy there. 80% of the House seats in this country are non-competitive. They have been gerrymandered. I mean, I'm standing here in Asheville, North Carolina, and I can't tell you if I'm in the 11th or 10th district. Why not? Because the Republicans, Republicans, when they got control of the North Carolina legislature, redrew the district law to guarantee that all Western representatives were going to be Republicans, and they wanted to do something about the People's Republic of Asheville, all right? So what they did is they brought, what they did is they brought the 10th district over from Gastonia and came and cut Asheville in, in half, diluted that part of the liberal vote. Then they took the 10th district from Boone and over there and, and, and the Western counties and died from the other half of Asheville. The district line, I mean, this is how petty it got, Warren Wilson, the most liberal government, <laughs> they actually, the, the, the House, Repe House of Representatives dividing line goes right through the middle of campus. It's called computerized redistricting. I used to ask my students, look, take an average college junior with, take their computer skills. Take an average, take a smart college junior poli sci major, okay, and get the two of them together and uh, and, and say, look, we got twelve representatives districts in the city of in the state of North Carolina. I want you to draw them up so that the Republicans always win at least ten or nine. How long would it take you? <laughs> no. <laughs> I've had comments like, "What lunch breaks a day and a half?" Computerized redistricting, which the supporting, I mean, gerrymandering according to race, the courts have ruled as unconstitutional. Gerrymandering according to political parties, the courts have ruled is constitutional. Okay? The solution to this, and I understand this doesn't have a snowball's chance at all, but it does not require a constitutional amendment. We need proportional <coughs> representation. <coughs> For all states that have more than two electors, two 
members of the House. Okay? So it would work this way. North Carolina. Okay? We now have strong political parties. The Democrats would nominate 12 members for the House of Representatives. Okay? Number one is the head of the party, number two, three, four. The Republicans would also nominate 12 members for the House of Representatives. And the Libertarians get to nominate 12. And, please God, the Green Party gets to nominate 12. See what it? constitutes a party then? I mean, what? Anybody that wants, anybody, you know, if you can, you know, we could, you, we could get together, okay? <laughs> probably, probably we'd say you need 5% of the previous election or something like that, or so many signatures on a ballot. It's, it's, it would be hard to do. And, and we just put them on there. Then we have the election. You vote, now you vote for political parties, because that's where the power is. So the Democrats get 40% of the vote. The Republicans get 30% of the vote. Okay. The Libertarians get 5% of the vote until when they're at 75. Uh, we'll give them 10% of the vote. And the Greens get 15%. Okay. Now, the Democrats get four of those 12 seats. See it? The Republicans get 30%, and we have, you know, we can just do that around. And now you're rewarding third parties. You can have a multi party system because now the Greens can come, can come in there and say, vote Green. We will do this, and we've got the power now. We will do this, we'll do this, we'll do this. We're going to enforce the Clean Water Act. Okay? We're going to put strict regulations on, on uh, Cowan's Ford. The Democrats say to the Greens, oh, that's too, that's too much. You can't do that. You've got to compromise. You've got to join us or else the Dem and, and the Greens are saying, we don't need to join you. It's not all or nothing anymore. We'll take it. We'll win our four seats, whatever. Then when we get down to Washington, and it's time to elect the Speaker of the House, and it's time to elect party committee, party chairman, guess what? You don't have the votes. You're going to have to come to us to get the votes to be a majority and get all that power. And believe you me, we're going to ask something in return. That's the way it works in Germany. And it to a certain extent, in, in, yeah. I mean, we are the only country in the world who has this system. So I think strength of political parties. I mean, obviously, proportional representation doesn't work where you only have one, one member of the House of Representatives, and you can't really gerrymander when you only have two. You can put all the Republicans in one district, that you're going to put all the Democrats in the other. But, it, but states, and I would like to know how many states have more than two members of the House. Probably a considerable number. <coughs> okay. Get rid of the whole. We can do that. We can do that. The next opening session of Congress. Okay. The Senate. The, the Senate votes on its rules, which is which is a simple majority vote. You can't filibuster through the rules. You could change that. All I would ask is somebody to stand up there and say, do this, Democrats, or we're going to punish you. Kay Hagan ought to get asked what she thinks of that. Okay. This is tougher, but does not require a constitutional amendment. Voting rules are up to the states to decide. In fact, two states already have proportional representation. Maine has proportional and I think, no, Colorado proposed it and voted it down, but I think there's another states. Two states have proportional representation already. Okay. Uh, strengthen political parties. <clears throat> and the essence of it all is to, to, understand, to understand it is to have democracy, it seems to me, and a bunch of other people, you have to have responsible government. You have to know who's making the decisions. Yes? 
And to have responsible government, to have democratic government, you also have to have accountable government. You must be able to reward and punish them for the decisions that they make. Under this system, elected representatives are completely unaccountable to the people. They're not accountable at election time. They're not accountable e afterwards. I mean, those, co those corporations spend billions and billions of dollars on lobbyists. They're not fools. They're getting something for their money. And what they're getting is the government of the United States. And they know, they know, I mean, they'll, t they'll, they'll tell those members of Congress, you know, vote our way and there'll be issue ads coming out. Don't vote our way. And, uh, we can hold you. Who holds, who holds, I mean, political parties can't hold elected representatives accountable. The people can't hold elected representatives accountable. Who holds them accountable? And there's a name for a system where this ruled by the rich, and it's not called a democracy, it's called a plutocracy. For the last, ruled by the plutocrats, ruled by the, for the last, gosh, five, six, ten years of my teaching career, I quit, you know, when I was teaching American government, I quit teaching that this is a democracy. I just could not stand the hypocrisy of it anymore. So if you don't think it would do any good, if either the move to amend ended up with a constitutional amendment that said that free speech does not include uh, giving money, or corporate free speech does not include giving as much money as possible, or if, I, I don't a, see how. or if there was a Supreme Court decision that overturned it and ruled that it, it wouldn't do that much good anyway. And well, I, but I don't see how, because I think Alito and Scalia are essentially right. Spending money is free speech. I mean, I give money to Karen. Not as much as she'd like. <laughs> <laughs> but why do I give money to Karen? I give money to Karen because I want her to spend it. <laughs> and what do I want her to spend it on? I want her to spend it on putting out the message of Riverlink. Right? I mean, I'm all in favor of free speech. And I'm in favor of, you know, I'm not, sorry Karen, I can't give you a check for $50 million this week, but, uh, <laughs> next week will do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, you see, that's the problem, the logic of it. Now, if... I have an alternative. One thing you can say is, maybe we could say this. Corporation, yes, corporations are people. Or I have person. But they're a weird person. They're a different kind of person. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just like we just like for instance, we say human beings under the age of 18 are people. Some of them. Uh, <laughs> they have rights, some rights. But they don't have the same rights as adults. They can't sign a contract. They can't vote. Okay? Just because you have rights doesn't mean you have all the rights. So maybe you could say, look, yes, corporations are people. Yes, corporations are standing. Yes, corporations can sue and be sued. Corporations have procedural rights. They have rights in court. But they don't have substantive rights. They don't have freedom of religion. They don't have freedom of speech. Corporate speech is not speech. Well, I can hear Scalia tearing into me on that one. So maybe that would help. If, if, if that happened. Yeah, yeah, but I'll tell you. I mean, that's about as good as I can get. And I'm not very confident. <laughs> I'm not very confident at all because even I recognize, man, that's the thing. But maybe just as much chance as proportional voting. You said that didn't have a chance. In yeah, maybe. yeah. <laughs> maybe something to do something to strengthen political parties. I think, you know, couldn't you just do away with the pri I'm just thinking out loud. I never thought of really about this. You do away with the political uh, primaries, and you campaign finance. Everybody, you run in for the House, you, you get this much money. and we, we Who gets that much money? You run for the House. Oh, the candidates? Yeah. Yeah. Get the, you all get 25 But who gives them that money? The government. It would be cheaper for us as taxpayers to pay for the elections than to suffer the consequences of allowing unfettered funds to decide. It would be cheaper. It but would be less expensive. But it would be less expensive, but my, my my qualm, I guess, with your system is what does it do to political parties? If you're getting your money directly from the government, all right, and not through and not through political parties, 
then, then I mean, I want to strength, that strengthens the government. <laughs> but what does it do to political, who decides, who decides who would run, who decides who would get that money? I mean, who decides who, now? I mean, I, well, now I it's just, get down and pay fifty bucks and yeah, and, and get the. And I mean, now all you have to do is most most elections are just, most candidates are decided by the primaries. So I want to eliminate the primaries. Right, so we get rid of the primaries. Everybody runs. <laughs> we get rid of the prime. We get rid of the primaries, and the candidates, the candidates that run, um, are determined by the political parties. This is a return to Jacksonian democracy, which I understand. Sammy Hall, there was a lot about it that was corrupt, but there was, it's time to go back and revisit it. I mean, I know when I was growing up, who got to run for the, who got to run for the House of Representatives, or who got to run for the General Assembly? The long-time party workers. You worked your way up from the system. You, God, I, I wasn't even, I was 20 years old. And I'm driving around the car, taking voters back and forth, and you know, and getting my little car checked. Good, Frankie, you worked three days for the Democratic Party. And and the guy I work for, you know, his father. I won't say who his name is, just because it sounds like John Belaterio. But his father was the local party boss. <coughs> and we got we work, you know, we worked for him, and he he delivered the district. Guess what? It, by the way, guess what it did to voter turnout? We had like ninety percent voter turnout in our district. Why? Because we're pounding on the door. Let's go. Get out there. I'm too busy. Well, we'll come back again. We had high voter turnout, right? And if and if and if the Democrats won that district, and they always did, the people of that district knew who to go to. Mr. Deleterio, my social security check. Was he an elected official? Or he was a party boss. He was a party boss, and then, of course, when there was an opening in the house, state house, boom, he went and ran for the state house. John, my buddy, went went to work for Campbell Soup for thirty years. And one of the nice things about Google, you can find out what your old classmates are doing. And guess what he's doing? He's an advertising consultant for Obama. Yeah. Why? Because he worked his way up through the system. He proved his loyalty. And he got rewarded. He was accountable. Now, I think that there were issues of corruption there. And, you know, maybe some public disclosure. As long as we're spending all our time doing this, candidates are never forced to talk about the issues. They're only to, uh, forced to talk about what a creep the other guy is. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I'm, I'm philosophically opposed to that. Yeah. I don't want to hear what a creep your opponent is. I want to hear what it is you're going to do to make a difference. And but the, but the other thing I wanted to hear. And, and I don't. But you, see, but you see. And the other thing. But it was like, I and I don't care about you. Because you don't have that much power. Even and anyhow. What party do you represent? What principles are you going to stand for? And how are you going to get something done? Right now, they can sit there and they can promise you anything they think you want to hear because nothing holds them accountable. And what the biggest problem is, the, every time I hear an American say, oh, I don't vote for the political party, I vote for the individual, My, I, I cringe. Well, get, guess what? You don't vote, you just vote for the individual? This is the system you get. A system where individuals can lie to you, and even if they tell you the truth, I don't you know. Well, so you're saying straight party voting creates an atmosphere where people don't lie? No, straight party straight party voting creates an atmosphere where people are held responsible. Where people, I mean, the conservatives, the conservatives in Canada, God, it's been 20 years now, said, <laughs> vote for us, and we will bring Quebec into this union. We will get the Quebec to sign the Constitution. We will have a Meech Lake Accord. We guarantee we will do this. So the Canadians voted in the Conservatives by like 60%. And for four years they fought that Meech Lake. I was living up on the Canadian border at the time, fascinated with it. And the Meech Lake Agreement fell through. The Conservatives did not deliver on their promise. And the next, next election, the conservatives got 2% of the vote. They lost their status as a major political party. 
they were punished by the Canadian people for not carrying forth on their promise. Barack Obama promised we were going to have a public option on health care. I wanted a single-payer system. Definitely I wanted some way to regulate costs. And what do we get? We get this crap called Obamacare. Where, where 20 year olds are being forced to carry the burden of the 70 year olds. And you think they're resentful? You, you know, you ought to be. It's a, ma it's a major, Obamacare is nothing but a major boon to the private insurance companies. If you don't believe me, look what happened to their <laughs> stock once it was passed. He had a majority in the House. He had a majority in the Senate. He had made a promises to America for a public option. Which I, I mean, you know, I didn't want a public option. I wanted, I wanted, I wanted just take, you know, just take Medicare. That's my health plan. Take Medicare and make it a play applicable to everybody. That's what Medicare is. It's a single payer system. You get to pick what doctor, yada, 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 and Medicare pays for and you tax, you tax workers, you tax banks. Well, and I was, you know, I was willing to compromise, maybe that was my mistake, and say, okay, I'll settle for a public option figure, and it's going to become Medicare pretty soon. And we didn't even get that. So, they, you, who do I hold responsible? Who do I punish? I'm pissed. You go punish the insurance company. You go. <laughs> I can't. Well, well, <laughs> don't pay your premium next month. Well, I don't pay a premium. I've already. Well, no, see, I, I, I like my system. I don't pay insurance premiums. I'm on Medicare. But you don't pay, pay a premium, then you go to the doctor and you don't get treated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Who would you punish? I would much rather. Now, if I had. I would like a public option. I mean, you know, I'm not. I, I correct that. I, I have a private insurance company, Humana is my prescription plan, plan B. And I pay them, they're okay, you know. Uh, I wouldn't mind seeing what, I, I wouldn't mind seeing, first of all, what the executives of Humana are making. <laughs> and secondly, I wouldn't mind having a public prescription plan that I could also pay premiums to. Why you take Congresses? Well, yeah, George, George Bush says we have a public <laughs> option to go to the emergency room. And he's absolutely right. That's and he's it. absolutely right. And what does the emergency room do? The emergency room doesn't cure you. The emergency room, and ask any emergency room doctor, what they do is they, quote, stabilize your condition. And send you back to your and what the, And what does stabilize your condition mean? It means they get you so that you can walk out the door. Mm -hmm. spend a lot of money. And, 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 and you walk out the door, none of the causes have been treated. None of the, you know, none of the, and so what happens? Two weeks later, you're back in the emergency room. That's why... Americans rank, that's why America ranks number one in the world on spending on health care and like number 16 in the world on, on health of its citizens. But Boehner says it's the best system in the world. <laughs> yeah, and there's not a shred of evidence to support that. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not in favor of socialized medicine. Socialized medicine is what they got. I mean, we have socialized medicine in this country. It's called the VA. I mean, that hospital out in Oteen is owned by the federal government. All those doctors work for the federal government. They're federal employees. That's socialized medicine. And for veterans, I don't know. Single-payer system is what Canada's got. Okay. Just build the government. Build, yeah, build the government, which the doctors would love. Build the doctors, pay into it over your life. And I like this about Medicare too. It doesn't give everybody everything they want. I mean, my mother, rest her soul, my mother got a pacemaker put into her heart five days before she died of lung disease, which cost like sixty thousand. What was the point of that? My father was told to get it. My father was told he needed knee transplants at ninety-five years old. I mean, I think Medicare should pay for basic. Basic health care. You know, eighty percent of your of other and if you want something more, I agree. If you want something more, go out and buy a supplemental policy. 
All right? Want to, you know, go out and get a prescription drug benefit. Go out and get, I can't afford a supplemental policy. But you know, Judy's parents have supplemental, you know, get Medicare and supplemental policies. That's a good system. It, it, you can control costs because you can't get, you don't give everybody everything they want. Yeah, but the supplements won't pay if Medicare has them. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, Medicare, 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 Medicare is going to be the first resort. Medicare is going to be your basic resort. So it's not a, a system where you, if Medicare doesn't pay for it, then you can get the yeah, yeah, supplement. Yeah, 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 right, 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 right. But we can have, we, what we can have is, and, what, and this is what I want, we can have a basic health care system that guarantees every American some level of health care. Now, I don't want to pay to give some 80-year-old woman breast implants. All right? Oh, come on, Fred. <laughs> well, I've been through the 80-year-old woman, is right. <laughs> I can't beat that comment. I quit. <laughs> Thank you. That was fun. Thanks. Uh, so next month.